welcome everyone. The Journal Club is one of my favorite sessions that we run here at Dime. If you haven't participated before, um, this is a very discussion-based sort of informal structure where we have uh, the wonderful opportunity for our members to talk with um, uh, sort of leading scientists uh, in the field um, and specifically about these publications that they've been working on. Um, today, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Ewan Clay from Evidation Health um, to talk about his uh, recent JMIR publication, uh, looking specifically at continuous uh, digital monitoring of walking speed. Um, it was done outside of the clinic and in a frail and elderly population. So I think there's a lot we can learn today. Um, before I turn it over to Ewan to introduce himself and give um, a little bit of an overview of that study, I'll give you all a, a brief introduction to how we, um, how we run the session. Ewan will take a few minutes to sort of give his uh, author, uh, author highlights of the study and of the science um, and of its potential impact. And then we throw it open and it really is discussion based. So uh, hopefully many of you have read the study um, and have some burning questions on your list. Um, if you just want to unmute yourself and ask a question, if everyone speaks at once, I'm not a shy moderator, I will help with that. Um, there's also the opportunity if you're uh, in a public place and it's loud, you can always type a question into the discussion box. Um, outside of that, uh, welcome everyone. Ewan, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about this um, and take it away, please. Great. So it's, uh, you'll hear me okay? Yeah. Quick thumbs yeah, up. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation and, and for the uh, very kind introduction. So uh, the work that I'll present or talk about today is was the culmination of many years work uh, at Novartis, uh, where I was for 10 years. Uh, I'm now at Evidation for about a week. Um, and the, the work was really a, a collaboration between uh, Novartis Research, uh, the LMU, uh, which is a, a, a medical hospital in Munich, uh, and Trium, who are the producers of the actual device uh, that was used in, in the study. Uh, and yeah, as Jen mentioned, it was, it was one of the first attempts, at least at Novartis, to try to augment what we could already do in the clinic in terms of performance measures with something that really went towards uh, sort of a real world measure. Um, so we weren't trying to, although our initial thinking was really to try and let's say replace sort of six minute walk test and similar gait tests. Ah, I see I'm getting the sun, California problem. Um, really our, our thinking, as I say, over the years really evolved more towards, you know, let's not try to uh, replace these performance measures but let's try to augment them with behavioral information that really sort of helps us build a more uh, complete chain of evidence around what we're doing there um, so the paper as i say was really a culmination of, of multiple years of work um, and actually does everybody see the second slide the overview slide now I can. It's, uh, there's a little bit of a delay uh, so the, the, the study actually incul in, incorporates uh, two different, or the, the paper incorporates two different studies. Um, and so we took really a, a split approach. So um, obviously one of our main concerns was simply whether or not what we were measuring was accurate um, and really accurate in our target population, which as Jen mentioned is uh, a, a geriatric, a, a frail population. Uh, so it's a disease called sarcopenia. Um, so we all lose muscle mass uh, and muscle strength as we get older, uh, but there are some patients where that loss is really accelerated and it heavily impacts their quality of life in particular in terms of their uh, independence and mobility. Um, and so this has been kind of a, 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 a disease that's not been particularly heavily studied, partly because we haven't had the measures to actually um, put numbers on uh, what these patients were dealing with in terms of their disease burden. And so, as I say, the first study really focused on just simply validating the accuracy. Um, so the primary measure that we were focusing on was gait speed, uh, and in particular gait speed in the real world. So we wanted to make sure that we could really accurately measure it before we started to um, 
really discuss whether it was meaningful uh, or how it related to some of the other measures that are already used in this space. And that data we really collected then as part of a, an interventional phase 2B trial. Uh, this was a, a global trial with around 250 patients, uh, sort of 30 sites globally. And uh, those two studies were, were conducted independently, although we did do some kind of bridging work to make sure that the data from one study really informed what we saw in the others. Um, and uh, that independent validation study was also really kicked off because we saw that you know, the, the initial algorithms that we had developed um, in, were based on data collected from healthy volunteers. And while the algorithm performed well in healthy volunteers, um, it really did not perform well and had really uh, significant biases in our target population. And so that was really one of our early learnings from this work, uh, which I think started in about uh, 2015, 2016, um, was that, you know, really to make sure, you know, accuracy is, you know, is a, a, a qualified statement. You know, you have to say accurate in a particular population and it's no guarantee that you're gonna your work is gonna lift directly from one population into another and so today I'm just going to walk through some of the key results um, so really we had three primary aims uh, as I said firstly just establishing accuracy um, you know this is a intended as a clinical measure um, we started discussions with the EMA around 2017 um, and there has now been you know, additional regulatory work. So it really is important that when we say what we say, you know, that we are really accurate in that statement. Um, there was also a lot of concerns when we first started this work simply about feasibility. Um, you know, this is a digital health approach, but we are working in a geriatric population. So of course there was a lot of concerns whether or not patients would comply um, and whether we would be able to get the data that we needed. Uh, in order to derive these insights uh, and then yeah as I say what how our thinking really evolved uh, once we started to get that data coming in um, and then at the end I'm just going to quickly start touch on some of the next steps and, and where that work has gone since uh, in particular the Mobilize D uh, consortium which is a, an IMI so an innovative medicines initiative so an EU um, funded framework uh, to take this work forward for regulatory acceptance across a, a number of different indications. So as I say the first study that we talked about uh, was, uh, was this independent validation study um, and it was a sort of semi-controlled environment I think we can say um, so it wasn't uh, really a um, you know sort of controlled environment test like a six-minute walk test we actually created almost like a, a parkour where we had uh, elderly frail patients walk uh, a sort of a trail through the hospital both inside and outside uh, on level you know underfoot was both level and stairs and turns and things like this to try and simulate real life um, and those patients were followed with um, a, a device that uh, had been developed to sort of allow uh, a continuous me measurement of their gait speed while they went through the parkour. So that was our reference that we were um, validating against. Um, and there's a, a PeerJ paper uh, on that um, system for measuring the reference data, uh, which I, I have in, in a slide at the end. Uh, and this is the figure A at the top. Um, and so this is, it was sort of 25 or 30 patients, multiple runs through the parkour. Uh, and you can see that there's a, a very good correspondence between uh, what we uh, projected as their continuous gait speed um, and what the reference. Uh, so this is all in meters per second. Um, and so the, the projected gait speed was calculated from a three-dimensional inertial sensor that was incorporated into their center of mass. So it's a small device that actually uh, goes into their belt buckle um, and so it's designed for a uh, very long-term wear there's a very long uh, life battery in there um, it's very uh, non-interactive deliberately um, it's really just intended to be worn at the belt buckle um, you know comfortably for long periods of time without much interaction uh, and from that three-dimensional inertial data we're basically firstly recognizing steps uh, so recognizing periods of walking um, and breaking that down into uh, individual steps and each individual step is then parameterized um, in terms of um, you know the forces and and the the temporal parameters 
And from those features, we're then project, projecting uh, gate speed. And what's important to note also from this measure is you can see that the reference speeds are almost all under one meter per second. And so for a healthy individual, one meter per second is a sort of a typical comfortable walking speed. Um, and this was exactly one of the issues that we saw from some of our early data, which is published elsewhere, um, that once you get below that one meter per second, so into the kind of uh, speeds that we're seeing in our patients, um, these biases become uh, much, much, much stronger. And you can see that there is still a slight uh, tendency to overestimate speed in very, very slow walkers, so really under uh, half a meter per second. Um, and at this, at this sort of ranges, it becomes very, very hard simply even to recognize walking. Um, so the, the forces involved in the steps become so low that simply recognizing the steps, recognizing that periodic motion becomes uh, very, very hard. Uh, I should also point out that these patients are not otherwise pathological, um, so that it's not that they have, say, like unilateral injuries or Parkinsonian gait. Um, they are sort of, let's say, normal walking, but just very, very slow and frail. And I think, and again, as I said earlier, that's an, an important consideration that it's, it's not a given that this algorithm would perform equally well, say, in a Parkinsonian population. Um, that would require an additional study to validate that. Uh, and the B figure that I present here is kind of the bridge into uh, the interventional clinical study. So we wanted to make sure that really in our patients uh, in the interventional study that we really did see that same good performance. Um, and so here is a very similar figure, but what we're doing is comparing the, uh, the ActiBelt derived speed. This is the, the device that we were using. It's called ActiBelt uh, produced by Trium. Um, versus the clinical reference speed. So this is taking the average uh, gate speed collected in the four meter walk test, which is the first box, uh, and then the six minute and 400 meter walk test, which is the, the middle and right hand boxes. Uh, so the, the first, the four meter walk test is obviously a very, very uh, short gate test. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of inherent variability um, simply because it's very hard to, uh, or sort of the, the, the operator error has a, sort of um, uh, an outsized effect simply because the test is so uh, so short uh, but nevertheless we see very good performance uh, and then in the long uh, gate tests you can see that the performance is yeah is uh, you know well over 90 95 percent uh, correlations um, which is great um, and you can see that again in the patients in our um, actual interventional study they are down towards uh, the sort of 0.5 meters per second gait speeds, although some are quicker. Uh, and again, remember that these uh, clinical reference speeds, these are performance tests. So the patients are trying to walk as quickly as they can. This is not uh, necessarily a self-selected or sort of um, daily walk speed. Uh, this is really going towards their maximal abilities. And so with these results, we were really comfortable that when we said that they were walking in a, in, you know, at a particular speed in an, uh, the, uh, um, in the real world, so where they're unobserved, uh, that we were at least making accurate statements. Um, but of course, um, we needed to make sure that firstly, that there was actually feasibility, that we were actually getting data from the real world. Um, and so this is now an overview uh, of the um, all the data that we collected in the study. So the, the wear time is color coded from purple through to yellow. Uh, so purple is where they are really returning us 24 hours of data uh, per day uh, down to next to, next to uh, you know, maybe just a couple of minutes. Uh, and gray is where we really got no data whatsoever. Um, and so the patients were not in, actually told to wear the, the belt all the time. Uh, they were told to wear it uh, in the, the week or two weeks um, around their clinical visits, which is why you see um, these sort of uh, wave patterns. Um, so the, the regular visits, uh, so it's all lined up versus their uh, day zero, so their, their first day in the study. But you can see even without these, um, you know, the, the, or without the instruction to, to wear it all the time, uh, you can see that some patients uh, for some of the lines at the top really are wearing it uh, all the time without being asked to. 
uh, and equally many most of the patients are actually highly compliant uh, around their visits so they are getting some prompting from the clinical sites you know please make sure you wear it in the next week or please make sure it or wear it in the week before you come to your visit uh, and if they reported that they forgot um, they would be reminded again to wear it in the week after their visit um, so they were not given any uh, feedback or prompting otherwise um, because we were worried that giving them active feedback or active prompting to wear the device um, would influence their behavior in the real world um, and we wanted to avoid that because in the interventional study um, increases in their mobility was sort of the primary outcome of the study and so we wanted to avoid any uh, sort of uh, confounding or any influences that were not coming from the, the drug itself. But overall we were very pleased that even with this extremely minimal approach so really just as I say no instruction or no uh, active feedback no prompting uh, we still collected around 10,000 patient days of data over the study with um, most of the patients being monitored for around six months. Um, so really quite a significant amount of data uh, for uh, in this population. And then I wanted to just run through some of the insights that we saw from that, uh, from that data. So this is all now data from the, uh, the real world data. Um, and so one of the, I think one of the really key results, um, or one of the really key insights, uh, and this sort of differs a little bit from uh, some of the other uh, approaches that are looking at uh, real world gate speed, is that we see that uh, gate speed is highly, highly context dependent. And of course this goes for any um, real world measure. Uh, and so the figure on the top is uh, just a couple of vignettes. So the one, two, three boxes are just uh, the data from three individual patients. Uh, and then the, the bottom right hand box uh, is the overall population. So this is all the data that we saw. And all we're doing here is actually inferring a little bit of context. And so we're breaking up the data that we see into what we call bouts. And so a bout is just a, a, a contiguous period of walking. Uh, and so you can, so going left to right, what we're dividing is very short periods of walking. Uh, so this would be maybe just walking across a room uh, out to sort of the 160 to more than 320 steps. And so this is uh, sort of, uh, you know, a five or 10 minute period of continuous walking. Um, and so the first, and the, the papers are in the, or the figures are in the supplementary uh, of, of the paper with the overall distributions of how much data we see in each of these uh, bout buckets, the vast majority of walking uh, occurs in short bouts. Um, so up to 90% of some, for some patients, and we'll get relatively few data points for these very long uh, bouts of walking. Um, and this is important because um, the length of the bout has a strong relationship to the overall speed. Uh, and we see that in this population, that the longer that they walk for, um, the faster they go. Uh, and so what this means is that, uh, you, you know, the, these long periods of walking, uh, which are probably most representative of their sort of maximal ability, um, are kind of swamped by the vast majority of data in the short bouts, um, which are much, much, much slower. Uh, and so when we're trying to understand sort of what the patients are capable of doing versus what they actually do, um, we found that to make longitudinal comparisons through the data that we had, we felt it was important to sort of compare apples to apples uh, and to make sure that we were comparing bouts of similar length over time. Um, so not that the overall distribution of bout length was changing, uh, which would in, induce an, uh, an overall average change in the bout speed, um, but really to make sure that we were comparing similar contexts over time. Um, and so one way that you can see the importance of this kind of inferred context is that uh, we found in this paper and we demonstrate for, uh, as far as we're aware, one, the, the first time uh, what the relationship is between um, what you see in the clinic uh, and what you see in the real world. 
And so this is the vignettes at the bottom. And so other people have looked at this problem to try and understand what this relationship is. But when you compare the, the, the distribution of all real world gait uh, to what you see in the clinic, it's very hard to draw comparisons, as I said, because you're not necessarily making uh, like to like comparisons. Um, but when you, for example, compare these short bouts uh, to the short gate speed tests, you do see a linear relationship. And here you can really see um, how the short gate test really is a performance test. And you have patients going up to or even beyond 1.5 meters per second in these very short gate tests. But the corresponding real world gate in similar bouts uh, from that week, uh, they're rarely getting above half a meter per second. Um, and so this is sort of a clear difference that between that behavior in the real world and, and then what they're actually capable, their performance in the, in the, in the, the, the clinic. And you can see then the corresponding data when we look at the longer gate tests. So the, the six minute and 400 meter gate test. And again, you can see uh, you get a, a reasonably strong linear relationship um, and actually the um, more uh, sort of a one-to-one -one relationship or at least compared to what you see in the four meter gate test. So um in these long bouts they really are approaching their maximal performance ability um so a patient that perhaps in the clinic is doing a meter and a half uh we, it will in the real world be walking at maybe one or 1.2 meters per second um so it really shows that by focusing on these long uh periods of walking contiguous periods of walking these long bouts uh, you get a much closer idea of um what their actual performance abilities are on any given day or week uh, and this is an important insight because as i said it allows us to take these uh, validated clinical assessments that are performed maybe once a month or once every three months uh, and augment them with a then a continuous metric that we're collecting uh, each day or each week um, and it gives us an idea of how their um, their, their gait their, their their independence their mobility is changing uh, on, a, on a continuous basis, uh, actually in the real world. Uh, and I think this is really important because it allows us to actually move towards uh, thinking about their perceptions of quality of life, uh, which are mostly informed by their perception of their independence, their perception of their own mobility. Um, and so what we want to do is understand what that link is between these classic in-clinic performance measures uh, and what the patients actually perceive in terms of their own uh, mobility and quality of life. And that was really one of our main motivations at the start, as I said. So a lot of this work uh, continues um, and we really hope, we really feel that, as I say, that gate speed is a, a really, really important measure uh, of independence, of mobility, which of course is a, a central domain in quality of life. Um, and so we are uh, continuing this work in a number of ways. So obviously, firstly, we've made uh, not just the, 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 the studies uh, are public, we've published them. Uh, we also published uh, a version of the uh, independent validation study. So a precursor version of this, um, where we were sort of working out how to actually do this parkour protocol. Um, but we've published all of the data that goes along with all of these studies. Um, so that's all of the raw data as well as the derived data and the reference uh, data as well. So we're, really hoping that somebody out there is going to go and uh, produce even better performance than what we managed um, and continue moving this work forward. And as I said at the beginning, we've also, uh, this work was at least partly the basis for uh, a project called uh, Mobile ISD, which is a EU federally, federally funded uh, consortium um, with both academic and industry partners, uh, which you can read about here which is taking forward uh, this work on gait speed in sarcopenia, so in, in sort of frail and geriatric patients, um, and pushing forward uh, towards regulatory acceptance of these new measures, not just in sarcopenia, but also in uh, a number of other indications, uh, which is, as you can uh, read about here. And yeah, if you're interested to hear a little bit more about some of our other work uh, or what's going on currently, I, I also included some links here at the bottom. Uh, and with that, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. 
Um, Ewan, that's fantastic. Um, for the few uh, attendees who uh, dialed in after my initial waffling, um, please feel free, everyone, to um, unmute yourself. Everyone has the ability to, uh, to speak um, and ask your questions directly of Ewan. Um, otherwise, please type them into the Q&A. Hi, Ewan. Uh, this is Pip. Hi, thanks for that talk. I've been reading your paper. I really like how uh, methodical it was and how the data is like available to uh, for, for when I get some time to dig through it. That'll be that'll be a great uh, great resource for training and further research. I'm sure. Um, one thing I think about in terms of like further research, you said previously that um, any algorithms that are developed may not be appropriate for say a Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, population and that's kind of what we get in patient reported outcomes questionnaires as well you you, exactly. you develop something in in a population you have to make sure it works in another population they so ran the study to validate this using the parkour method perhaps in a Parkinson's population there's two outcomes one the algorithm is great fine let's carry on with our study but the other outcome is that the algorithm doesn't work we have to develop a new algorithm do you think from your experience we could then use that validation study data to then develop a new algorithm or would it have to be a, a further study? The question is how much bang can you get from your buck from these validation studies really? Can they be validation then, you know, development if the validation fails or not? Yeah, it's a, a, gr yeah, a great question. So I, I think firstly, I think for us, um, this approach is, is firstly a framework, right? Um, you know, you know, using this uh, independent study, the, the parkour methodology, um, you know, obviously it gets present, presented like uh, this was our plan right from the start and it all worked out great and wasn't it awesome. But of course, you know, there was a lot of dead ends here, um, you know, and a lot of mistakes were made or a lot of lessons were learned. Um, and so that was one of our reasons for sort of wanting to put the work out there is that, as you say, as people move into other indications, uh, that they don't re repeat our our mistakes and that they you know can learn from from what we did to accelerate their work by you know really from the start making the right steps um i think the the data and the reference data so you know my hope would be that ultimately that there can be an algorithm produced that is um relatively disease agnostic or completely disease agnostic or at least agnostic across uh, a number of similar indications so in that case um, you would get a lot of reuse value out of the data that we've published because you know you may you know you would basically add into that data set into that training data um, additional data now from say parkinson patients and you may well then be able to train an algorithm that is performant across both groups. Um, and this is very much the approach of Mobilize D, or this is one of the things that they want to find out is whether you really need um, an algorithm that is just upfront tailored for a particular indication, or whether you can create an algorithm that uh, is useful across a number of different uh, populations. Um, and again, also we're, we're thinking that you know, it's not just overnight that you have Parkinson's, say, or you or that you have sarcopenia, right? It, 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 these are mostly chronic conditions and that there is a uh, an initial deterioration that precedes your diagnosis um, where your symptoms may be less severe. Um, and so, again, we're also very interested in algorithms that are, as I say, sort of generally applicable into frail populations. Um, that may not necessarily already have those specific pathological aspects like Parkinsonian gait that um, I think might well need, you know, a, a tailored approach. But there are many other conditions that uh, where patients have just, as I said, sort of generally reduced mobility uh, without necessarily uh, um, sort of, yeah, as I say, a specific pathology. Um, so we've also used this al or the same algorithm in um, for example, patients that have um, uh, limited sight. Um, so it's actually, you know, their, their gait or their mobility is not limited by their sort of muscle physiology, but by their confidence almost um, to walk um, at their physiological ability. Um, and so, and it worked very well in that setting. Um, and the group is also continuing to look at, for example, like unilateral injury, um, 
and uh, sort of things like uh, osteoarthritis where it's only on one side or one knee um, and so how does the algorithm perform in those sorts of settings where you're not getting a um, or where you start to get asymmetry from the left to right steps um, and whether or not the algorithm can handle that sort of uh, those sorts of situations um, but as I say, that's why we make the data available. And, and that's really a specific aim of Mobilize D is to generate more and more data across different uh, indications, different pathologies, um, so that we can move towards that point. Thanks for that. That's a really comprehensive answer and a lot of uh, things to think about there. So thank, thank you. I look forward to looking up the Mobilize D project. And, and again, it, it's EU funded. So uh, it's all, I think, or my understanding is I, I'm not part of the consortium. Um, that all of that data will ultimately be made publicly available as well, um, again, because it's publicly funded. Um, so that should come out in the next uh, next couple of years. And I say even in the midterm, you know, the performance that we got out of our algorithm was pretty good. Like we were happy. It allowed us to um, get the insights we needed to move forward in those clinical programs. But, you know, I'm sure that there are other approaches. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, smart kids out there, you know, computer science backgrounds um, that can do a lot better than us, uh, or maybe look at other aspects of gait or uh, falls. Um, so we also included annotation data like that as well. Um, you know, this, as I say, it's 10,000 days of data. You know, this is, there's so much to be mined out of that. And so again, part of our hope of making it publicly available is that people will pick up on uh, problems that may be more relevant to their work than it was to ours or look at it from a different perspective. Um, and so, yeah, we really hope that there will be future papers coming out referencing this data. You and I wonder if I can, um, Pip, that was a great question. And you and sort of building on Pip's question about um, thinking of thinking about how accuracy can always sort of only be determined in a specific patient population. And then what you were saying about um, the value in making the data available. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting in the discussion part of um, the manuscript was when you were talking about the importance of context and obviously using actual function as a measure of exercise capacity, for example, is measuring what you are doing as opposed to what your what you could potentially do. Um, and so, you know, you, you spoke about the importance um, of collecting metadata um, and specifically, you know, can we get some survey data to be a companion? Um, there's also, I've heard a lot of questions over the years about, you know, well, no one's going to be that mobile if there's a snowstorm, right? So if you wanted to develop the most robust sort of gate data set, what would be your dream laundry list of metadata? <laughs> uh, yeah, again, yeah, we had a, a lot of, um, a lot of discussion around this. Uh, and, and again, I say a lot of when this work was started, um, you know, as I say, we really focused on the ActiBelt system, which is, let's say, just uh, an inertial sensor, a three-dimensional inertial sensor. Um, so we're not collecting actively any context at all. Um, and that, as I say, that we really tried more to derive inferred context from that data. Um, and again, we're looking for longitudinal trends. So an individual, like, as you say, kind of a snowy day uh, or something like that may cause a blip in the data, but they're not going to influence overall longitudinal trends. Um, you know, again, the way that we aggregate the data is specifically uh, tries to avoid that. But I think nowadays, you know, this is, yeah, three, four, five years later, uh, as you say, the, the, the potential to kind of annotate this data with other sort of orthogonal informative data streams is just massively increased. And I think also a lot of ethics committees are more open to these sorts of things. So I, I think for me, straight away, what I would want to have is at least some sort of uh, geographic annotation. So you can kind of do a proxy for this where, you, you know, you, if you, so if a patient is 
at a certain site um, you can just take for example like local weather data from that site you know you know where the hospital is located so you know that they must be within you know a certain distance of that hospital and you can take for example the, the so almost all airports will have uh, open an open API for local weather data so you can sort of basically just uh, scrape rain temperature humidity these sorts of things um, but I would love to have a much more granular impact or a granular view of that uh, where for example you know you're taking sort of regular or semi-regular uh, positional information from their smartphone for example um, and there's actually quite a lot of work that already starts to do this um, in particular uh, there's a, a whole stream of research. We, we cite the paper in, in the discussion. Uh, it's from a, a researcher called Markus Reichert. In, in, so he's, he works in uh, a university in Germany and focuses on uh, uh, depression. Uh, so a sort of ambulatory assessment of de or feelings of depression. Uh, and he primarily works just with questionnaires. Um, but what they had the great idea is just to tag, just do a geo tag on when the questionnaire was filled out and where it was found out and what they found was that geographic context had an enormous influence on how people reported how they were feeling um, and I, I have absolutely no doubt that you would see similar uh, effects you know that kind of external influence uh, on people's mobility um, you know I would also love to start to look at the social aspects of this as well you know so mm -hmm. Um, as people become more isolated, uh, they're, they're going to tend to become uh, more, or they would tend to become less mobile, right? You know, these are the uh, sort of, you know, elderly people who will tend to stay at home. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, then maybe their carer comes around or, or so a family member comes around and that day will be much more active than a typical day for them. Um, much more nearer their actual performance abilities and I think that sort of uh, sort of you know it, it gives them confidence to um, sort of be a bit more active and I think that's a really really important aspect because it sort of leads into then uh, sort of more the territory of sort of behavioral interventions right so where you are yeah you know again it's commonly done for example in in diabetes nowadays right where people are uh, tracking all of their meal um, data alongside their continuous glucose monitoring and so and there are now systems that will prompt the users and to say hey you're not having a great day and last time this happened you ate this and you felt better um, based on that historical data and i think you could imagine something similar in this sort of domain where you're saying hey um you know, last time, you know, Pip came round, you know, you were really active. Um, you know, you can do this, right? You know, why don't you invite him around again or, uh, and this sort of thing. And you start to introduce that social aspect, which is well known in geriatrics to be a really important aspect in maintaining mobility and independence and even actually sort of cognitive performance and things like this. Um, but again, if you can't put a number on it, if you can't measure it, uh, it's very hard to demonstrate the value of these approaches. And so I think, yeah, definitely, if I could get any metadata in the world, uh, it would definitely go in, in that direction uh, of really very, very orthogonal data. Um, so social dimensions, um, you know, geographic dimensions, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I wasn't aware of that depression study. That's, that's yeah. a really wonderful example. It, it, um, it's super interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Um, Michelle, you've, uh, you've raised your hand. If you'd like to unmute yourself, what's your question? I, I do have a good question. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, as someone who's still fairly kind of new to digital medicine and these clinical research trials, I'm just curious, as you talked about, one of your goals was to really establish validity of the, the sex, sets you are collecting. How do you define validity? How do you sort of come to terms on what what that really means or what threshold needs to be crossed in order for you to determine that it is um, valid or referring yeah. to like a valid study, like who would the data? Yeah, no, no, this is a great question. And, and also 
one of my personal hobby horses. Um, <laughs> so I, I will now start a giant rant. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you're exactly right. It, and it sounds like a semantic sort of, or, or a pedantic point, um, but validation needs to be qualified, right? And so as we put in, in the paper and, and generally, and, and this was something that we made through our own personal experience, experience right? That, you know, I, you know, I come from more of a technical background, sort of machine learning. And so I would talk about validation in the accuracy sense. Um, and so I think, you know, I'd be like, oh, we've validated this and this, and then I'm talking to a clinician and they're like, for them, it, that, that's not validation. For them, validation implies meaningfulness. Um, and so when what we had to do was really update some of the language that we used and to really talk about technical validation, uh, which really leans more towards accuracy. Uh, and this is the, the sort of independent validation study that we talk about in the paper. Um, and then there is really clinical validation, um, which is, goes much more towards meaningfulness. Uh, and so typically, for example, like accuracy can be validated in, you know, a single assessment, cross-sectional, uh, you know, can you tell the difference between this group and that group, um, basically. You can establish accuracy in that way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it means anything. And so the, the clinical validation is almost exclusively that based on longitudinal data, because what you need to typically show is, uh, the relationship to established measures and usually orthogonal established measures. Um, so for example, showing that, you know, increases in real world gate speed actually corresponds to improved perceptions of independence. Um, so collected from uh, PROs and questionnaires. Um, but usually the, the sort of the, the gold standard or, and this is why, and we don't actually include it in the paper. This is going to come out in a, a future paper. Uh, is, you know, you need to show that you are sensitive to change um, and you need to actually put a number on how big a change can you detect, right? And, and you know, if you're familiar with sort of clinical studies, this is always um, really one of the cr really sort of critical pieces of information you need to have up front when you're deriving or when you're designing a study is what is the effect size, Um and you need to design your study around detecting that minimum effect size that you expect. Um, and so a lot of work will then go into, um, you know, can we detect differences between uh, treated and non-treated groups? Uh, can we get, you know, uh, dose dependence or sensitivity, you know, so, so we, can we show intermediate differences between uh, high and low doses, um, you know, uh, how many patients and how long do we need to monitor them before we can uh, actually detect those differences. Um, and so one of the hopes uh, or one of the sort of big dreams for digital medicine uh, and in particular digital endpoints uh, is that you will be more sensitive to those changes because you're, you're getting um, continuous data. So you're getting kind of the, the advantages of repeated measures uh, much, much sooner as compared to um, sort of monthly or, or quarterly assessments in a clinic, um, that you're much more sensitive to those day-to-day -day changes and you're much more sensitive ultimately to the longer term trends because you're getting, let's say, you know, a number every day rather than every three months. Um, so yeah, it's a really important question and I think it's actually, um, you know, when we talk about development of new measures, I think it's really important really important to get those semantics defined up front that you know what kind of validation are you talking about yeah that was that's really helpful thank you fantastic um and um i get on that hobby horse too you and so <laughs> <laughs> you have company um pip um you have a a question and i think let's make this our last one Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I agree with the validation stuff, and I'm, I'm just an off-hand off, off -hand point, but I'm, just, I'm excited to look through your data set to see if I've got some ideas for cross-sectional validation taken from the PRO literature that I'd like to see if, if they work. So I'm going to have a look through and see if I can do anything there, but uh, I'll get in touch if I can. The question is commercial-grade um, wearables. So there's been an article in Nature recently um, comparing, it was um, poly... You say it's a photoplethysmography, which is you know the heart rate measure in these yep. watches. 
and stuff, and it was sh showing that the, the research grade um, ones actually didn't really perform as well as an Apple Watch <laughs> in all intents and purposes. But really, the, the idea is like the commercial grade stuff is getting as good as, if not you know, exceeding to some extent, the research grade stuff. And we, we I think we're, we're trying to figure out how these fit into um, clinical trial endpoints. But it seems like alongside figuring that out, we've also got this new question as well, like not just how do wearables fit into these clinical trial endpoints, but what level of wearable do we need? Is it okay to go for the consumer grade wearable um, or do we have to go for these research grade ones and are the research grade ones actually you know <laughs> do they even compete with the consumer grade ones at the minute i just wonder it's not really a question but your general thoughts in that sort of area would be would be appreciated yeah again yeah it's a great question and yeah an important topic and, and as you see now our papers are starting to come out where you know research is actually starting to probe this um and I will, I'll sit firmly on the fence and say it depends. Um, so our approach is really to being, you know, I, I think moving towards commercial devices uh, in the long term, um, I think has has a number of like very serious upsides. You know, in, in, I mean, just in terms of patient engagement and adherence, um, you know, very few medical devices or very few um let's say just generally non-commercial devices have that you know it, it's not integrated with their daily lives you know and i'm thinking of things like yeah apple watch things like this you know it's you know they put so much thought into making that device user friendly and and yeah as i say integrated with the rest of their their day you know the the adherence question just basically just goes away, right? But of course, then the, there are other considerations, right? You know, they're, they're probably not sampling the data as at higher rate as a research device because they're trying to conserve battery because again, that's something that annoys patients if they have to charge it regularly and so forth. And then there's also the cost implications, right? I think it's probably not talked about enough, but if you're gonna move into you know, very large studies or so registration studies where you've got maybe 10 or 20,000 patients and even more if you're going to move into uh, sort of, let's say, public health settings. Um, so, for example, now what Apple is doing with their uh, single lead uh, ECG work, you know, the devices need to be cheap if you're going to move to that kind of scale. And there are things that you can do on that scale that you just can't do anywhere else. Um, but our approach has really been to start conservative and work towards that point, right? So, you know, we really started with research grade um, sensors because we didn't know what data we were going to need. So we, our approach has always been to, to over sense. Uh, and we've published a couple of studies actually where we've really specifically done over sensing studies. So, uh, just done small non-interventional validation studies where we've had individual subjects wear at the same time 20 different devices because we didn't know where it was best to place the device on them you know and 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 if you if you're lacking that kind of information the only way that you can start is to really go all out um you know and really collect as much data as you possibly can and that typically will come from uh, a research grade sensor which will be collecting it you know 100 hertz, uh, very large uh, ranges of sensitivity, uh, maybe multiple devices. Um, but obviously, the intention is not that, you know, the intention is specifically not to move into the clinic and into the real world with that kind of setup. You know, we're totally aware that that's not feasible. But you need to know what data do you actually need for a given application. And so I think for some applications, you know, ultimately, you know, a Fitbit might well be fine, right? You know, there's a, a lot of really exciting work now coming out with uh, commercial grade um, sort of activity and, and vital sign monitors, uh, looking at, for example, um, you know, flu and, and things like this, where that data is, is clearly enough to identify these patients and to identify their recovery or not. Um, but equally, I'm sure that there are other problems that where you will need that high density data. So again, coming back to the Parkinson's um, uh, question, right? You know, if, if you're trying to detect, let's say, for example, um, 
you know, very specific, um, you know, tremors or something like this, you're going to need very high density data to approach that question. So I, I think it, you know, as I said, our approach has really been to start oversensing um, and then work once we have a system that works, uh, work towards a minimal system. Because at the end of the day, as I say, we want to burden the patients as little as possible. We want their exposure to technology to be as small as possible. Because at the end of the day, they need, you know, they're the ones that actually need to collect the data. Um, and so we want to make that as easy for them as possible. Um, but we, what we don't want to do is, for example, just make an assumption use a commercial grade device because it's cheap and has brand recognition and things we put that into a clinical study and then it turns out that actually with minute level summaries we can't answer the kind of questions we're interested in you know because then all of their efforts have been for nothing and so you know we're always very aware that you know patients in trials are not volunteers you know they they would rather not have that disease they would rather not be in a clinical study so we really try to do as much upfront work um, as possible to make sure that the system that we're pushing forward um, really collects everything we need and and nothing more kind of thing. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, that's a really like thought through answer and it really does sort of set out that difference or what you should be thinking about when making that assessment of what do I need in this trial. So yeah, thanks for clarifying that for me. Fantastic. Um, that was a great question. And actually, you and I loved um, the idea of starting by oversensing until you realize you're getting exactly what you need. That's a really, <laughs> that's a good guardrail. I'm going to be using that. Thank you. Um, so, Ewan, this was a tremendous discussion. Thank you for sharing your expertise on this. I definitely think thank you and your colleagues, not just for the paper, but for making that open data available. Um, and delighted to hear, Pip, that you're going to be diving in. And I, I look forward to hearing if you are able to dig anything up. Um, some quick notes before we close um, our next journal club and we we actually had some nice lead into this today is going to be looking specifically um, at Parkinson's we're going to be looking at um, developing digital biomarkers specifically for resting tremor and for bradykinesia um, using a similar kind of technology actually and other more accelerometry data and how else can we use this so join us for that discussion um, we also have a webinar coming up uh, with uh, Andre Blackman from Onboard Health and Bray Patrick Lake, um, also from Evidation, actually. Um, and they are going to have a wonderful discussion about, you know, how can we start to think about inclusivity and innovation? How can we think about um, developing and then retaining a really diverse workforce? And I'm excited about that. It's a core value here at Dime. How can we make our digital medicine workforce better reflect the patients that we're all trying to serve. So Ewan, thank you again. Thank you everyone on the line for joining for great questions. Good discussion today. Um, Ewan, I have like a page and a half of chicken scratch here. This was amazing. I learned a lot. Thank you for your time um, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.